So let's grab our Bibles. You're going to need your Bible tonight, whether you have a physical copy or you're using your, your, uh, your phone with your Bible app. But I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. That's Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. We're going to be looking at, uh, in fact, I'm going to read this entire thing, but it's not going to be on the screen behind me. It was just too many verses for us to type and put up there. But uh, this is the second parable, and we'll talk about parables in just a moment. But what we're going to be doing, for those of you that may be joining us uh, brand new, what we're going to be doing for the next several weeks is walking through several different parables that Jesus told. And in the process, we're going to be digging down really deep into the incredible grace that Jesus talks about. And we're going to listen to how he describes it. We're also going to be looking for the impact that his grace has on people who need it, which I personally believe are all of us, and the impact it has on people who resist it. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight. So Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, your Bible may refer to this parable as the parable of the unmerciful servant or the parable of the unforgiving servant. Um, I'm not going with either one of those because I think the main character here is the king because the king is the one who dictates what happens. So I'm calling this sermon, Grace and the King. So let's jump into verse 21, and let's just go down through the entire story. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Now, he's very specific when he says who sins against me. He's talking about somebody who does the same thing to you and does it again, and does it again, and does it again. And he, Peter asks the question, shall I forgive him up to seven times? So if this person does the same thing to me seven times, and I forgive them each one of those times, is that enough? Uh, Jesus answered in verse 22, he says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And some of your translations may have 70 times 7. That's a really difficult uh, area to, for them to, uh, I can't think of the word I want, translate. Uh, so it can go either way. Verse 23, Jesus is going to respond to Peter's question. Therefore, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a servant who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. The king of heaven is like a king. We'll get this straight, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. And yes, you can just stop and try to take that in. I have no idea how much that is. Uh, this guy was brought to him. He owes the king 10,000 bags of gold. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Wow. Verse 26, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The master's servant took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. What an incredible story. And if we could just stop right there, we would all be, you know, like, wow, that's a great picture of what God does. He cancels our debt and he lets us go. But that is not the end of the story. And Jesus had more in mind for this story. Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Now, remember, we're drawing comparisons here. We're in a, we're in a parable. He grabbed him and began to choke him. So just literally think of your hands around that person's neck. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees. This should sound familiar. And begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. I've never understood how by throwing somebody in jail, they're going to pay the debt. I do not understand that. Verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. 
Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And then verse 35 just summarizes the whole lesson here. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let's pray as we get into this message. Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we were trying to understand grace, and a great big part of grace is understanding forgiveness. And Father, I understand we really don't want to face it. But the truth is, unless we have your forgiveness, we're going nowhere. We're certainly not going to heaven. We're not going to be in your good graces, so to speak. We need your forgiveness. Help us to understand why it was so important in this story that the forgiveness be passed on. Speak to us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Amen. We're continuing our discussion on the subject of grace tonight, and we're looking at the parables of Jesus. Last week, I told you that the word parable uh, in Latin literally means comparison. And in the Greek, it means to place side by side. So in this parable, Jesus wants to compare the way that we forgive with the way that God forgives. So he places God's forgiveness on one side and our forgiveness on the other side so that we can see that forgiveness, well, here's what we realize. We, we know our forgiveness has limits. I don't care how loving you are, how patient you are, our forgiveness has limits, but God's forgiveness is unlimited. And this is gonna be a big concept for us to grab onto tonight. Peter's question prompts Jesus to tell this story. And what's interesting about his question is that it assumes that forgiveness has limits. So he asks, he says, hey, Jesus, if a brother or sister continues to sin against me, how often should I, or how many times should I forgive that person? What's the limit here? Is it seven times? And Jesus says, nope, not seven times but 70 times seven or 77 times, whichever your Bible says. Now, Peter really shows his cards here because basically he's asking Jesus, when is it that I can stop forgiving somebody? Now, he wasn't asking the question because he wanted to know how many times he could forgive, but he was asking the question because he wanted to know what the limits were, how or when, can we stop forgiving someone who continually comes back at us, who continually hurts us? So this guy owes the king, and let's put it into maybe terms we can understand. He owes the king like $100 million. Okay, I'm sure that's what you got in your bank account, so you understand what we're talking about. The king says, pay me. And the guy says, I can't. And the king says, okay. I'm going to sell you and your wife and your kids and everything you have, and I'm going to put you in prison until you can pay it back. So the guy falls on his face. He pleads for his life, and the king has mercy on him and cancels the debt, sends him away. We think the story's over. But this guy is only gone from the king's chambers for, I would guess, maybe five minutes when he runs into somebody who owes him like 20 bucks. That's the comparison, okay? $100 million, 20 bucks. And he says to him, you got to pay me. And the Bible even says he puts his hands around the guy's neck and starts to choke him. Pay me. And this guy does the same thing that the other guy did with the king. He falls on his face. He begs the guy for mercy. The guy says, sorry, no mercy for you. You go to jail until you can pay me back. Then the rest of the servants who worked for this king hear about what happened, how the king had forgiven him, uh, and how he wouldn't forgive the person. And so they go and they tell the king. And the king is outraged. 
He's furious. He summons the first guy, brings him back in. And it's like he's saying, what is wrong with you? I just forgave you of like a $100,000 debt, $100 million, a debt that you could never repay in 100 million years. I forgave you that with no strings attached. You walk out of here and your response to my mercy is to walk out and demand that this guy who owes you 20 bucks that he pay you right now. And because he says he can't, you throw him in jail. And again, the king is furious and he throws that guy in jail. Now, I, I know it's pretty easy for us to read this story and we think about the unforgiving servant and we go, what a jerk. Come on, you know, what is wrong with him? The problem here is, I'm sorry to say, we are the unforgiving servant in that story. I know you don't really want to hear that. I don't like hearing it. But we are the ones who pervert God's forgiveness of us by withholding forgiveness from other people. We do this knowingly. Sometimes we do this kind of without thinking. We do this in conscious ways and I think even, even unconscious ways. But Jesus' point is very simple here. Given the incredibly unpayable amount that he owed and the full forgiveness of that debt by God, let's think about the incredible debt we owe and how God has forgiven us that debt, we should be incredibly quick to forgive. There are no limits to how many times we should forgive someone because there are no limits to how many times God has forgiven us. That's the main point of the story. In fact, earlier in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus spells it out when he teaches his disciples how to pray. And, and you may remember this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and then we get to verse 12, look at it, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus wants his followers to know that in light of God's forgiveness for me and you, there is absolutely no scenario whatsoever that warrants our unwillingness to forgive. And Jesus makes it incredibly clear. Our refusal to forgive is the greatest proof that we don't understand how much we have been forgiven. Let me say that again. Our refusal to forgive is the greatest proof that we don't understand how much we have been forgiven. That's my biggest concern about preaching this to you tonight, is that you don't fully grasp and understand how great your forgiveness is. But you and I have been forgiven. If we're children of God, we have been forgiven, and that is an incredible thing. And, and in this story, it's so obvious. The beauty of the story is its simplicity. Uh, the message is profound. But it's just a simple little story that Jesus tells to get this across. And, and we read the story and we think, oh my goodness, what is wrong with this guy? He was just forgiven a hundred million dollar debt and his response is to throw a guy in jail who owes him 20 bucks. Jesus wants us to see ourselves in the mirror of the unforgiving servant. He wants us to know something about his forgiveness of us and what that ought to look like in terms of our relationships with other people. So there is a direct relationship here between the way that God has treated us and then how we are supposed to pe treat other people. Jesus wants his disciples. He wants his followers. He wants us to know that there is absolutely no cutoff point for forgiveness ever. That they may never, ever allow someone's repeated offenses, we should never allow this to happen, to have any effect whatsoever on our determination to forgive. None, none whatsoever. Now what's interesting about Peter's question is that he doesn't simply ask, how often should we forgive someone? He qualifies the somebody 
uh, somebody who keeps doing the same thing. I mentioned this a moment ago to you. See, he's not painting a picture of someone who wrongs you once, says they're sorry, and then asks for forgiveness. He's painting a picture of someone who doesn't stop wronging you, who doesn't stop sinning against you. And Peter's question is basically, is there a limit here? Paul Zoll, Z-A-H-L, what a name, Paul Zoll. He's a great author. He said that he's been serving the church for many, many years. And here's what he wrote. And in his experience with most Christians, we Christians are good for about three or four times. That's about it. He said that he's seen this in old people and young people and everybody in between. In his experience, most Christian people are good for about three or four forgivenesses. I don't know if that's a real word or not. But after that's over, we're done. It's like after the third or fourth time, mm -mm, you know, fool me once, but, you know, I'm not going to do that again. It's like we've reached our limit. But Jesus also makes it clear that it's, it's, it's not enough for us to simply say, I forgive you. It has to come. Did you catch the real bottom part of that, the end of it? It's got to come from the heart. That bar is incredibly high, way up here. Never stop forgiving the person who never stops sinning against you. And I know this sounds so impractical, and I know it sounds like, well, David, there's no way that I could do that if you knew what they did to me. It's not me you need to argue with. It's Jesus who's saying this. It's, it's not enough for us to simply muster up our willpower and say, okay, fine, I'll do what's right even when I don't feel like it. I forgive you. That's not good enough. Jesus says it actually has to come from the heart. In other words, you have to mean it. So you not only have to forgive 70 times, seven times, you have to want to forgive 70 times, seven times. And your hurt that you may have experienced from them is no excuse to offer any kind of half-hearted or reluctant forgiveness. Now, I gotta tell you, as I, I got to this point in the sermon and I was working through the text and I'll be honest, I was feeling really low about this point because this standard is so high, seemingly impossible to reach. And I found myself going, okay, I'm in trouble because I don't do this. And, and I doubt that there's anybody that's watching us right now who, is, who does this either. I mean, just you answer this to yourself. Do I forgive every single opportunity that I have? And, and we are very good at justifying our refusal to forgive. We, we come up with a thousand different excuses. Well, he never said he was sorry, so I don't have to forgive him. Or she never actually admitted that, what she, that she's the one who did that to me. So why should I forgive them? Or, or he never even asked for forgiveness. Or she's done that one too many times. We, you, me, all of us, we do this all the time. So Jesus's point was clear, whether we like it or not, it is never okay to not forgive. Never. Refusing to forgive, refusing to forgive someone for any reason at all is never ever justifiable before God, even though we might justify it to ourselves. Our refusal to forgive in light of how much we have been forgiven is as maddening and irrational as the servant, this crazy servant in this story. Now, I know it brings up a lot of questions. We could talk about enabling people. We could talk about boundaries. We could talk about, you know, does forgiving someone mean that you have to welcome them back in the same way that they were before? That's not what Jesus is talking about in this parable. He's not talking about the danger of enabling someone. He's not talking about the need for boundaries. Those things have nothing to do with bottom line forgiveness. We all have people in our lives that we need to create boundaries with. I'm, I know that. And we have all made the mistake of enabling people who were enslaved to some kind of destructive habit. Jesus is not talking about enabling. Jesus is not talking about boundaries. Forgiveness has nothing to do with that stuff. So please don't hear Jesus 
tell this story and allow your mind to wonder as mine has, you know, you know, somebody does something and you're going like, okay, now what about that? Come on, Jesus. What about that? What about that kid? What about what that woman said to me? What about that parent? What about my boss? What about this person that I need to create space from because their destructive habits are not only hurting me, but they're hurting the people that I love. It's an honest, honest question, but it has nothing to do with forgiveness. And in the end, that's really a good thing for all of us because if God's forgiveness had limits, please hear me, if God's forgiveness had limits, the way our forgiveness has limits, we would all be in big trouble. We are connected lovingly together and God is the God of repeated offenses. Did you hear me? God is the God of repeat offenses and repeat offenders. Now, every so often, I will hear somebody say something like, well, pastor, isn't it a good thing that God is a God of second chances? And my answer is no. It's not a good thing because I need a lot more than a second chance. We all do. God is so much better than that. God is not simply the God of the second chances. He's the God of one chance, and we all blew that. And so now he's the God of the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. That's who God is. And I, can I just tell you where I'm at on this? I often need more than a second chance most mornings before I even leave the breakfast table. I, I don't know. Maybe you're that way too. Now, when... If, if you're looking at, at this from some of the perspectives that I've been looking at uh, over in the book of Luke, and I'm not going to give you a passage, but it's very clear that Jesus's mission is to set us free. He writes about, this is what Luke writes about. He writes about the time when Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. That was like their local church. He goes into the Sabbath on the Sabbath. He's considered a rabbi. So they hand him the scroll, one of, the, one of the Old Testament scrolls. They would always read a verse or a passage for the day. And so this was what Jesus was doing. He's reading that. And it's so interesting that the passage he reads, it's not interesting, it's a God thing, is from the book of Isaiah. And Jesus is really reading his own mission statement. And part of it goes like this. I have come to set the captives free. I have come to liberate the oppressed. Jesus' mission is to set us free. Why? Because he loves us. And there be, may be nothing that keeps us from that kind of freedom except our unwillingness to forgive someone else. Failure to forgive keeps us bound up and makes us bitter. And it hurts us far more than the people we are reluctant to forgive or the ones that we're refusing to forgive. So if we go around counting people's sins against them, you know, let's say, you know, okay, I'll give you three months or 3,000 uh, miles or something like that, you know, and then your sin quota runs out. Uh, listen, if we live that way, we are still enslaved. This passage of scripture that we started with has really convicted me to the core. And I've had to deal with some of that this week. I'm well aware that I'm not the only person who's ever been fired. After I was fired, I found myself uh, becoming very bitter towards specific individuals who once had said that they had my back, only later, to my way of thinking, to have stabbed me in the back. I was challenged. I was very bitter. I was challenged by some really close friends to let go of the hurt and let go of the bitterness. And I got to be honest, at first when they said that, I, I may have said the right thing back to them, but I don't know in my mind if I thought that was possible. The idea of forgiveness was about as far from my mind and my heart as you could be. But it was like God said to me, David, you can't lead others until you deal with this in your own heart. So a year and a half ago, I was reading scripture. I was reading, uh, I was reading books, the authors of which I had never even heard of before, but they had been suggested to me. And, and uh, the theme, it just was over and over again. The theme that I kept reading in scripture, the theme that I kept finding in these books was forgiveness and grace, 
grace and forgiveness, forgiveness and grace. You've got to forgive people because that's how God's grace is leading you. And they led me to this particular passage that we're studying tonight, and it brought me to a place of conviction, to a place where I had to admit what I didn't want to admit. And I saw such a correlation between this story, I'm not the only one who's ever come up with this correlation, between this parable and the words of Nathan the prophet when he confronted King David in the Old Testament about his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of her husband, a guy by the name of Uriah. Let me give it to you real quickly. Uriah comes into the palace and he tells David a story about a rich man who had lots of sheep and a poor man who lived just next door who only had one little lamb. Now, this little poor family had broken all the rules when it came to raising animals because they basically adopted that little lamb like a pet and they would let it eat from the table. And um, the family, it was just part of the family and some of you understand that. And so uh, somewhere through time, a visitor comes to see the rich man and rather than this rich man going out into his own flock and getting a lamb to kill and serve it to the visitor, he sends his servant next door to take the one little lamb that this poor man had, has it killed, and serves that to the visitor. When Nathan tells David this story, David the king says, who is this guy and where is he? And let's pick up the story. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. Verse six, he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then verse seven, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. I think every one of us knows that feeling when the truth comes home. This parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 18 spoke so clearly to me. It was like God was saying, oh, that's right, David, it's you. You're the one who is not forgiving. You're the one who's holding on to that grudge. And what, it, it, it stopped. what happened to me is I had to stop reliving those moments in my mind. I had to let it go. I had to stop letting that bitterness. Have you ever let a good grudge or bitterness kind of warm you in the evening? And you just kind of feel it in there, and that's what it was doing. I had to stop talking about it. I had to stop reliving it over and over again. Why? Because my God had forgiven me. And who was I to let his forgiveness stop with me? And you know what I came to understand? It didn't matter if I was right or not. I had to forgive because I had been forgiven. I now saw the fact that I would not forgive them in my heart was just as nasty as what they had done to me. I could not justify my lack of forgiveness just because they did what they did. God says that kind of unforgiveness is never okay. God never treats us that way, even though he would have cause to do that. I'll warn you, if you spend more time this week in this parable, this parable has the potential to cut every one of us to shreds. It may expose how bitter we have become or how maybe we like to shift the blame to somebody else. And let me tell you something, the moment that we realize that we have been that way, God can and will liberate us. I realized God didn't convict me because he was angry at me. He convicted me because he loved me and wanted to set me free from those things that I was in bondage to. And maybe I didn't even realize all of it until some friends said, you know what? You've really got to let go of this. No matter how hard we try, our forgiveness has limits, no matter what. We are broken people. We are living in a broken world with the rest of these broken people. And that means my forgiveness of other people will always fall short because I know what the standard is. It's very clear. We should always forgive 70 times seven, regardless of what the other person has done to us. And we should do it from the heart. But I read all this and I'm just like you. I'm going, I don't do this. 
I don't do this. I may try to do this. I certainly want to be able to do this, but I just can't seem to be able to do what I ought to do. We fail to forgive as we have been forgiven. And this leads to a certain bondage in our lives, which is really a cry for someone to come and do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. This high standard that Jesus has set should push us to the limit so that the only thing that we can cry out is, God, help me. God, send a helper. God, send someone who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And unlike our limited forgiveness, God's forgiveness is unlimited and unconditional. The truth about you and me is we need God's forgiveness every day. We need God's forgiveness because we fail. We need God's forgiveness because we gossip. We need God's forgiveness because we're impatient, because we're not always thankful. We need God's forgiveness because we tend to hold grudges. We need God's forgiveness because other people's sins against us bother us more than our sins against them. We need God's forgiveness because we fail to forgive the way God has forgiven us. But here's the good news. While it is true that we are in constant need of God's forgiveness, it's also true, write this down, God freely forgives. God freely forgives. I read to you last week from an author by the name of Robert Capon, and he's, he's got a great thing that he says here about forgiveness. Let me read it to you. He says, forgiveness is a gift given to the totally incompetent, not a reward given to the well-deserved. I love that. He says, the gift of forgiveness proceeds solely out of God's love and therefore proceeds any qualifying action on the part of the receiver. Before the prodigal son even gets one word of confession out of his mouth, the father runs up, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. And this is his point. God's forgiveness of us is not dependent upon our forgivability. Did you get that? God's forgiveness of us is not dependent upon our forgivability to which I say, thank God for that. If God's forgiveness was dependent on our capacity to forgive in the way that God forgave us, we would all be in big, big trouble. But it's not. It's not dependent on our confession. It's not dependent upon us cleaning up our act or getting it together. It's not dependent on whether we're worthy. It's not even dependent on whether we're truly sorry. His forgiveness of us is dependent solely on his love for us. Completely, solely, it's unconditional. We don't have to meet any conditions. It's the, it's, it's the same thing that we saw in the story of the prodigal son last week. He did not have to meet any conditions before his father embraced him. Forgiveness from God comes before our forgiveness of other people. Our forgiveness of other people does not come before God forgives us. Those are two entirely different things. And here is even better news than that. Get ready to write this down. Because of Jesus, God not only freely forgives, but God chooses to forget. That's right. That's what it says. God chooses to forget. It says he remembers our sin no more. Some of you may have grown up with an old him with had this line in it our sin is cast into the sea of God's forgotten memory I love that line we used to sing that on Sunday mornings our sin is cast into the sea of God's forgotten memory he not only chooses to forgive but he chooses to forget others may count your sins against you you may count your sins against you but isn't it good to know that God doesn't count our sins against us? And the entire debt that we owe, the 100 million that we owe has been paid and we are set free. This is really good news, people. This is what should warm your heart. This is what should give you peace when you sleep tonight. 
And understand this, even our sin of failing to forgive as we ought to, that is forgiven too. That, how, what incredible news. So the bad news is there's no way I will ever be able to forgive you the way God has forgiven me. I may want to, I may try, I may white knuckle it for all I'm worth, but I will never be able to forgive you and meet the standard of forgiveness in the same way that God has forgiven me. But the good news about God's forgiveness is that I'm forgiven for that too. That is a sin I am forgiven of. That is also a sin that is cast into the sea of God's forgotten memory. Now, the ironic beauty of all of this is that it actually, the more you know about this, the more you understand that you have been forgiven, the more it will motivate us, it will inspire us. Write this last thought down. God inspires us to forget, to forgive. The more that you read these stories, the more that you're going to see that God is going to inspire you. And listen to me. When God's forgiveness of us grips our heart, when you finally come to the point of understanding this, it actually makes us more forgiving. When it becomes real to you that you have been forgiven much, that you would not be going to heaven. You would not have a home to go to. You would not have the grace and the mercy of God to go to if you did not have this forgiveness. The more that you come to understand that, the more forgiving we will be. Now, we don't forgive perfectly. We don't forgive sinlessly. All of our forgiveness has limits and it falls short. But when our hearts are gripped by the greatness and the outrageous nature of God's forgiveness of us, we become at least a little more forgiving of the people around us. And like the guy in our parable, the failure to forgive other people is the greatest proof that we have failed to understand how much God has forgiven us. I made some statements to you at the end of the message last week, and I just wanna kind of rephrase them and restate them because I really believe this talking about being these kinds of people, this is the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church for those who have failed to find God's forgiveness because we understand God's forgiveness will find them. That's the kind of church we want to be. And I said it last week, I'll say it again. There's not a whole lot of those kinds of churches around. And I wish every church was like that. But we want to be that kind of church. We want to be the kind of church that sticks with people as they stumble along through the difficulties of life, the way God sticks with us. We want the crosswalk to exercise outrageous grace, the kind of grace that refuses to give up on those that are trapped by sin and their struggles, the way God has refused to give up on us. And let me remind you one more thing. When this kind of stuff comes alive, when you get a community of people together and they all begin to understand how much they have been forgiven and how much you know, people are honest about their struggles in life, let me tell you something. When that kind of stuff comes together, then it becomes very, very attractive to the people that are outside that are looking to find a place to find love and acceptance. Listen to me. The crosswalk is not a gem for spiritual muscle flexing. The crosswalk is a triage for the wounded, where moral insurance gets checked at the door, but where all are welcome. And we mean that, all are welcome. I don't care who you are, where you came from, what your background is, what you've done. Everybody is welcome, and everybody is going to be treated for who God made them to be, not based on what they've done. And I think the entire world is looking for a place like this. Now, I got to add this, but we will fail at this. These are very lofty goals. And I can promise you with everything that I have that that's the kind of church we want to be. And we're going to continue to strive and push in that direction. But I also have to tell you that we will fail. We will fail in all of these things in so many different ways. It'll make your head spin. We will fail one another. It will happen. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus' payment is not simply a one-time gift. 
Instead, it's a gift that will forever cover the charges that we will continually rack up. Our failure to be what God wants us to be because of Jesus is forever forgiven. Our failure to be as individuals, our failure to be as a church, who and what God wants us to be, what God calls us to be itself because of Jesus, we are forgiven fully for our inadequacies. We can never out the coverage of God's forgiveness. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has ensured that it be so. Would you bow with me for prayer, please? Father in heaven, thank you for loving us when we were unlovable and unloving. Thank you for forgiving us when we are unforgiving. Thank you for being merciful to us when we were unmerciful. Thank you for being gracious to us when we were being ungracious. Thank you for doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves and being for us what we cannot be on our own. This whole thing is about you, Jesus, about who you are and what you've done and the work that you've done on our behalf. And in you, Jesus, we are set free and we thank you for that. We love you because you first loved us. Father, please continue to show us how to be those people and how to be that church. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Have a great night, everybody.